Well, hey, good morning. It's good to see everybody today, and it is really, really good to see everybody today. So um, if you have not been with us the last few weeks, not to prolong this or anything, but uh, my family has been in quarantine due to some positive tests, and uh, it's, it's been interesting. It definitely has been interesting. You know, we've had some, uh, some people say to us, they're like, hey, did you enjoy your vacation? And I was like, you obviously have not had COVID yet. And they're like, huh? And I'm like, because it is the furthest thing from that. It, it's, it's, been, it's been more than interesting. And uh, I don't want to prolong it, so I'm not going to talk about it and all that. But we'll talk maybe a little bit about some challenges here in the message. But uh, I just want to say it's, it's great to be back in person um, with you all. To say that my family, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Rick. Appreciate you, Rick. They... Uh, um, you know, to say that my family and I, uh, Addie and the girls are, I mean, they're pumped to be. Michael's up with the middle school students and Chandler's in with, uh, uh, with the kids ministry and doing all that stuff. My wife is here. I mean, it's just so stinking good to be at church. Can you say that? Stinking good to be at church. But it, just to be together. And we know that we have several people that are joining us online. Some of those, you, you, just, you, you just feel more comfortable at this time being online. It's all good. It's all good. Some of y'all, you're traveling for uh, Labor Day weekend, and you're like, well, I'm going to go to church because in this day and age, you can go to church and, you know, be wherever. We're, we're pumped that you're here. We are pumped that you're here. But it is just good to be together. It was so funny to get some of the comments over the last few weeks in, in regards to the sermons. Uh, I would just literally, like, preach to an iPad. I mean, for those of you that were here, you know, I just, like, we found out late Thursday night, so I was like, holy smokes, what are we supposed to do? And somebody was like, well, just get somebody else to preach from you. I'm like, I didn't write this thing for nothing. And, and, you know, and so I just like hit the iPad record. I talked to DG, our tech director, and I'm like, I'm just going to preach to the iPad. But if you have an iPad, I got one of those ones with a keyboard. So the camera's on the left side, you know, so I'm just like preaching like this the whole time. And then last week, uh, I, I thought we would be home from quarantine to be able to deliver the, the message um, literally in Columbus at, at my nice wood paneled office at home, if you saw that one. And, but we need to stay down a little bit longer. So I was in a campground, Rob and Michelle, Picnic Point, where we used to take the junior high kids all the time at the lake. I, we were little. We took junior high kids there for years, and I just ponied up on a picnic table and hit the record button, and here we go. And somebody, literally somebody says, they're like, you know, that fake backdrop was just so beautiful. I'm like, it wasn't fake. That was the real deal. That was the real deal. But it's good to be back. We got a lot to get to this morning, uh, and I'm already going to warn you that there, I may go a little bit over, even though I shouldn't. I got my trusted stool here because the fatigue is still a real factor, and I don't want to pass out, and then, you know, Austin or Lee or Tom or somebody's going to have to get up here and just start going, or Scott's just going to start making up songs so we can go through the service. So I may sit down a, a few times. It, I need to share something with you that's awesome. Real quick before we jump into the text, two things that are awesome, completely different. Um, the first thing is this. Some of y'all know uh, a really, really good friend of mine. Uh, he's like a younger brother of mine. Uh, his name is Blake Haxton. And Blake Haxton is a U.S. Paralympic uh, athlete that we've known for years. He's a part of our church. He is a follower of Jesus. Some of y'all know him or his parents. And uh, Blake went to the U.S. Paralympic uh, Games in Tokyo this year. And he's the only U.S. Paralympic athlete to compete in two different disciplines. So he did his traditional skull, which is rowing, a rowing single skull. He did that. That competition is getting a little bit different because there's no classifications within that. And so he decided a couple months ago to pick up the sprint canoe, which is insane. We watched this event. It's nuts. Well, Friday night, late Friday night in Tokyo, um, I'll just say it because I love him. My man, Blake Haxton, took a silver medal in this sprint canoe, a silver medal. And uh, his brother Anderson and Blake are, are just really good friends of ours. Some of y'all know them. I got to show you this pic these pictures. Uh, glory to God, honor to people. You tell me that's not awesome. You tell me that's not awesome. The, the next one's even better, though. Here's, look at that. Look at that. That is so cool. Uh, Paralympic Games. And uh, my wife is a fifth grade teacher. She does a huge unit on this in her classroom about the Paralympic Games. But, I mean, I got tears coming to my eyes right now. Uh, of knowing people's stories, of what it means to follow Jesus and to follow Jesus together. Man, I'm so proud of that kid. He's not a kid. This boy's 30. He's a man. <laughs> but uh, just so proud of him and just so honored to, to, just, to just know what Jesus does in people's lives. 
Jesus is phenomenal. You know, today we're going we're gonna to be in the second to last week of this Summer in the Sun series that we've been in. And it's a series in the Gospel of Matthew that we've done over the last two summers. And so Austin shared with us weeks ago that um, we have literally spent in the last two years six months in the Gospel of Matthew, which is a phenomenal place to be because it's the Gospel account. It's about Jesus. But we have two weeks left. Today we're going to talk about the resurrection. Tomorrow, or tomorrow, tomorrow, come back tomorrow. Uh, next, next Sunday, we're going to talk about the Great Commission that wraps up in Matthew chapter 28. Here's the second exciting thing that we want to share with you. Next week, as we talk about the Great Commission, we have some missionary partners that are going to be with us in person. Matthew and Mary Matai, missionaries that we are in relationship with uh, from India, they will be with us in person to share some of the things that are going on within their work, the Lord's work, in India. Now, you may have heard the name Matthew and Mary Matai. Uh, We have a missions team. Huge shout out to them. We have an awesome missions team. I know we see so, several people in here, uh, Rob Fensenmaker, Tom Sherry, Carolyn. I know we have people on our mission team that are in this service. If you're in here and I miss you, sorry. Mission team is awesome. But they are in relationship. We are in relationship with these people. And Matthew is going to come, and he is going to share with us a little bit next week. But some of you all may remember that over the last couple of years, we have helped them plant churches and build churches in India. So we got two more pictures for you. These are some of the things. This is the, I mean, I don't know how to say this, but, uh, you know, maybe somebody from the missions team can correct me if I'm wrong. We, we partnered with them really to build this facility. And then also, uh, this is the inside, maybe of that facility or a different one, this, this is gathering places where followers of Jesus in India get to come and worship. And I'm telling you, it's, it's no holds barred. I mean, we've had friends here, Mark Motter, our chairman of our elders, he's been over there, Gary Martin has been over there, another one of our leaders here. I mean, there's no holds barred. I mean, they worship Jesus in these places. Matthew's going to be here next week. You do not want to miss it. Let's talk Resurrection. Let's talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Last week, we talked about the crucifixion of Jesus, the um, unsettling details of Jesus' crucifixion. They're unsettling for a reason, because it's, it's capital punishment. But more so, it's, it's an eternal punishment for sin that is placed upon Jesus as the Son of God so that we could be forgiven. Jesus chose Because of God's love, God's sovereignty, and his ultimate plan, the Son of God in the flesh chose to be tortured and to pay for our sins once and for all by dying on the cross. That's the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is the most significant event in all of human history. Here's the interesting thing. Even if you don't believe in the spiritual ramifications of the crucifixion, it is still the most significant event in human history. Read the history books. But today we get to talk about the most amazing event in human history. And that's the resurrection. That's the resurrection. So let's begin in the scriptures today. In Matthew chapter 27, we're going to begin in verse 57. So I know some of you that know the gospel of Matthew, you you said resurrection. Okay, that's Matthew 28. Well, you're going to have to back up a page. Because we're going to go in 27. But there's something really cool that happens before the resurrection that we just can't pass up. Let's open up the scriptures, the word of God today, and let's learn from that. Matthew 27, verse 57. Matthew says this. He says, The burial of Jesus. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Now, we meet this guy here named Joseph of Arimathea. That's what he's most commonly referred to. And the cool thing is, is Joseph of Arimathea is thought to have been a Pharisee. So he's a Pharisee. We'll talk about that here in a second. But he's also, we find in the Gospel of John, at the end of the Gospel of John, during the burial of Jesus in the Gospel of John, that Joseph of Arimathea is friends with a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is a guy, don't get lost here, Nicodemus is a guy that we meet in John chapter 3. Most notably, John chapter 3, verse 16. The mo- I don't know if you can say this or not, but this is what I believe. The most important verse in the entire Bible. John three sixteen, And Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, let me sum it up for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, the best gift that he could ever give. 
Whoever believes in him shall not perish. They shall not face the eternal punishment of something like the crucifixion, but they will have eternal life because Jesus, the Son of God, is going to die in their place. But more so, they're going to have life. Why? Because of the resurrection. And so this Joseph of Arimathea, friends of Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, look what he does here. In verse 58 of Matthew 27, he says, going to Pilate, the most authoritative man in this region. Remember, it was Pilate that had to give permission for Jesus to be crucified. It said, going to Pilate, Joseph of Arimathea asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Pilate just simply says, okay, give him the body. But that order has to come from Pilate. Verse 59, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb, new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Now that's a little bit misleading. He didn't roll the stone. Somehow engineering, for those of you that are engineers in here, they engineered a way to get this big stone in front of his tomb. This is not Joseph just pushing a little pebble over Jesus' tomb. No, this is a big stone. Verse 61, it says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite of the tomb. They were witnesses to this. All right, let's sit here with Joseph of Arimathea for just a minute and see what's going on. Let's think about what Joseph of Arimathea has just done. What do we know to be true about him? Well, we know his name's Joseph, pretty common name in that time. We know he's from a place called Arimathea, which we don't know a ton about. Even today, historically, we don't know a ton about the place of Arimathea. We know that he's rich, and it's thought that he was a Pharisee, meaning that Joseph was a part of the religious elite of Jesus' day, but even more so that Joseph was a part of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were the ones who opposed Jesus. I mean, for chapter after chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, the Pharisees have been looking for a way to what? To kill Jesus. Well, Joseph of Arimathea is a part of that group as a Pharisee, not as a part of the group that wants to kill Jesus. He obviously disagrees with the other Pharisees on this. We know that he's friends with Nicodemus from from the Gospel of John. But here's the thing. When we stop and think about what Joseph of Arimathea has done after the crucifixion to go ask for Jesus' body, to care for it, to put it in his own tomb, Joseph of Arimathea has taken a huge risk. And here's why. The other Gospels tell us that Joseph of Arimathea served on the council, which meant the Jewish ruling council, most likely known as the Sanhedrin. So Joseph of Arimathea most likely is a part of the most 70 important Jewish leaders in the community. And guess what this council has just done a couple days ago? Voted to ask Pilate to crucify who? Jesus. A vote that Joseph of Arimathea, and I'm sure Nicodemus, obviously disagreed with. Now think about the risk that Joseph of Arimathea has taken on. To to disagree with his contemporaries, the scriptures say he has become a follower, a disciple of Jesus. To believe that Jesus is not just a rabbi, not just a good teacher, but to believe that he's the son of God. Then to watch his contemporaries crucify Jesus and then go to Pilate, the Roman governing authority, and ask for Jesus' body. He had no idea what Pilate was going to do when he asked him for the body. He said, oh, so you're with them, you're one of them? Well, we better get rid of you too. Pilate could have said that. Joseph takes the body, puts it in his, in his own tomb, a brand new tomb. And it's not like people didn't know who was doing this. I mean, it cost him dearly. You think about this. You think Joseph of Arimathea's social status changed when he decided to follow Jesus? You think that there was risk involved here? I mean, you think, you think about this. When I look at Joseph of Arimathea, I just simply make the conclusion that perhaps following Jesus is a bit risky. I mean, when I look at his example, and that's why we're not even into the resurrection yet, which is what we're supposed to be talking about today. When I look at Joseph, I can't help but to ask myself this question. Jay, how has following Jesus 
been difficult for you in your world? How has following Jesus been difficult for us in our world? You know, what, what decisions have we had to make in this day and age that have been difficult for us because they're different than the decisions of others because we follow Jesus? You know, how many difficult conversations has, has Addie and I, as my wife and I, had to have with our girls about the way of the world in the way of Jesus because we as a family have chosen to follow Jesus and to claim Jesus as the Son of God. How many difficult conversations have we had, had to have? You know, has there been a time in, in our lives recently where we've had to trust Jesus with something, something that's very near to us, that is very difficult for us, and we had no idea what the outcome was going to be? We just simply were just called to trust Jesus. How has following Jesus been difficult for me in my world? It was difficult for Joseph of Arimathea. It was difficult for the disciples. You keep reading on in the New Testament, it's difficult for Paul. It's difficult for the women here, Mary and the other Mary. Yeah, there's some risk to following Jesus. I think we can feel that this day and age, can't we? There's risk in following Jesus. Now let's get to the resurrection piece here. Because while the cross changes everything, the empty tomb, the resurrection, gives us hope, always gives us hope, no matter what. So let's open up Matthew 28, and let's go to verse 1. In Matthew 28, verse 1, the resurrection account in Matthew's gospel, Matthew writes this. He says, after the Sabbath, which is the day of rest, love to talk about that sometime, it says, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Verse 2, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the, rolled back the stone and sat on it. I think that's awesome. This angel comes down and he rolls back this, this huge stone from Jesus' tomb and then he just chills. He just hangs out on the stone. He's like, there you go. I don't know if he's waiting for Jesus to walk out. I don't know if he's waiting for other people to come, but he's just hanging. Now look at verse 3, what it says. It says, his appearance, the angel's appearance, I believe, was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. Verse 4 is hilarious. Here's why. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. These are guards. You know, the section before this, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are going to go to Pilate and say, hey, this guy said that, you know, he, he's, he's going to raise from the dead. You know, we've heard some rumors about this. Guard the tomb because his disciples are going to try and come steal his body and say, hey, he's defeated death. He is the Messiah. And so Pilate's like, okay, yeah, let's throw some guards there. What, do you just think he took the rookies and put them out there? No, these are trained soldiers. I mean, these are guards. These are, you know, as, as my wife Michael will say because of me, these are stone-cold killers. And they're guarding the tomb of Jesus. And what do they do? As soon as they see the angel and see what happens, they stiffen up and they're like dead men. Every time I read about this in Matthew's gospel account, I think of something. Perhaps you know what it is. I think of this. Those fainting goats. I don't even know what, they, what the, the scientific term for them is, but I mean, I, like, wouldn't you love to have one of these for like a week? I'm not saying for like ever, but just a week, put it in your backyard so that when you came out, you could go, whoo, and it would just, bam, it would pass. There's a, some of y'all know Garrick Thompson. Garrick's been a part of our church for a long time. For some reason, Garrick and I always talk about these things. And we're like, it would just be cool for a couple days to just like, but I think this, these are trained soldiers. These are guards, and they go down like the fainting goats as soon as they see this. But there's a paradox here. Look at what happens in verse 5. The angel said to the women, okay, what the guards do? They fainted like the fainting goats. They're down. But the women, mm -mm, they're tough as nails. They don't do that. Look at this. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. One of 365 times this phrase, do not fear, do not be afraid, appears within the word of God. Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. The uh, new translation of verse 6 says this. He gone. He gone. He's not here. 
He has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Verse seven, this is the best verse, in my opinion, verse seven is the best verse in the resurrection account in Matthew's Gospels. It says, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead. Uh, A great author who I love, his name's Bob Goff. You should read his stuff, because he's really encouraging. But I love when Bob Goff talks about the resurrection of Jesus, because he says it like this. He said, Jesus done kicked death in the teeth. He kicked death in the teeth. He said he has risen from the dead. Look at this. And he is going ahead of you. He is going ahead of you. And it says into Galilee. Go and tell the disciples that you will see him here. But I love this verse. He has risen from the dead. He's not here. He has defeated death once and for all so that we can have life. So that anyone who would believe in Jesus... Anyone who would live in this world and know that there's all kinds of crazy things going on, but anyone who would come to believe in Jesus, that Jesus has defeated death once and for all for them so that they could have the hope of life both now and for all eternity. He's not here. Why? Because he is going ahead of you. I have to share something with you this morning, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to shoot you straight. I'm nervous to share it. I'm apprehensive to share it, but I just feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to, to, to share this and to be real. The last few weeks have not been fun. They have been the furthest thing from it. You know, to say that, that, that we, and this, this isn't about me, this isn't about my family, it's about us, it's about our community, it's about our church and our vision to follow Jesus together, but the last, it, it, the last few weeks have not been easy. And to say that we thought that the end of summer and the beginning of school would look a little bit different is a complete understatement. It's a complete understatement. And it's discouraging and it's difficult. And quarantine stinks. And being sick stinks. And sitting here preaching with a stool stinks that I should have sat on 10 minutes ago. But I refuse to sit on it and I'll pay for it later. It stinks. I'm sorry, I just have to say it. Watching our kids get thrown into war zones because people have such strong opinions about things, it stinks. And if you don't think it is, try raising kids in this world this day and age. When all you want to do is just follow Jesus. And you want to teach your kids to follow Jesus. And you want to be with people and you want to worship Jesus with them. And you want to do some life with them. And you want to just simply be an encouragement to one another. But every stinking thing that we wake up to says, no, let's not do that. It has not been easy. But here's the thing. We all struggle. Every single one of us struggle. Sometimes we struggle at the same time. Sometimes we struggle at different times. But we all struggle. We have challenges that we face. We have challenges within significant relationships that we have. We have challenges within our calling or within our workplace. We have emotional challenges or mental challenges. We have all kinds of challenges. And these challenges are real. And if we don't have the hope of Jesus and his defeating of death, what do we have? I think it's become very obvious that we have nothing without the hope of Jesus. As the world not proven that everything else will come up empty. It will. It will come up empty because anything that we have other than the word of God and the people of God will perish one way or another and so as we look at the resurrection today I I want us to go away with just one phrase Jesus is going ahead of you Jesus is going ahead of you and it's so easy to miss this in the resurrection passage because we do we think it's all about Jesus resurrecting from the dead and it is The fact that the Son of God can defeat death. But why does he defeat death? Because he's going ahead of us in our challenges, in the things that seem impossible, in the situations that you find yourself in that you're like, I have no idea how this is going to play out. Guess what? Jesus is going ahead of you. That's the covenant. 
That's the relational piece of what it means to believe in Jesus. That's why it's relationship, not religion. Because religion doesn't go ahead of us. Religion just tells us what we should and shouldn't do. Relationship says, I am with you, I am near, I am for you, I am right next to you, and I am even going to go ahead of you. Let me encourage you. A couple months ago, and and look, I, I don't buy into... I shouldn't even say this. I, I'm not a prophet. I'm none of those things. Uh, some of us that have really deep relationships, uh, I'm a guy named Jay that loves Jesus. That's it. That loves Jesus, loves my wife, and loves my girls. That's it. And I like to, I do like to, to share about Jesus. And I like to be with people who are yet to know Jesus. And I like to help people that have just come into a relationship with Jesus. Uh, whatever, I'm taking the gloves off. But most days I hate running a church because there's too much religion involved and not enough relationship. Now, please don't hear me on that, that it's like, hey, I'm going to go I'm gonna go run across 23 blindfolded. I'm not doing that. But here's the thing. Our relationship with Jesus is everything. And a couple months ago, as we struggle through these uncertainties, as we don't know what the future holds, there, there was a simple prayer that was revealed to me. Whether it was the influence of some close friends or just time within the word of God or just sitting there, and yes, I know you're gonna make fun of me, sitting in my backyard just staring at birds. It came to me. Lord Jesus, I need you to go ahead of me in this. And I wanna encourage you with that prayer, to adopt that prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you to go ahead of me and you fill in the blank. What is it? Is it a relationship that you're not quite for sure where this thing's going? Is it something that that is broken? Is it a loss? Is it grief? Is it anxiety? Is it uncertainty? What, What is it for you? I'll tell you what it is for me. It's anxiety. Lord Jesus, I need you to go ahead of me because I don't know why I wake up anxious more days than I would, I would care to admit because that gone things are so uncertain right now. Where do you need Jesus to go ahead of you? You fill in the blank, but know this, the resurrection, that's the promise. It's the promise that because Jesus is the Son of God, he says, believe in me. Let me walk with you, and I will go ahead of you, both now and for all eternity. I will not just prepare a place for you in heaven. I will prepare a place for you today and for tomorrow and for every day on this side of eternity. Where do you need Jesus to show up? Where do you need Jesus the most? Let me encourage you, fill in the blank. Lord Jesus, I need you to go ahead of me in this. The resurrection account ends this way. I'm already over time, so let me just simply say this. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they go to the tomb. And the angel just simply says, hey, don't be afraid. They see Jesus. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Jesus shows up. He shows up and it says, he says, go and tell my disciples that I'm going ahead of them. And it says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, afraid yet filled with joy, meaning it's okay to be afraid. Let's do this. I need to wrap this up, but let's do this. If you are afraid of something right now, if you're afraid, raise your hand. Okay, if you're not, Raise your hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're like, like, all right, you and I having lunch after church. You tell me how you're not afraid. Yes, it's okay to be afraid. It says, yet filled with joy, they ran and told the disciples, we've seen Jesus. Let's go to Galilee because he's going to meet us there. Jesus is going to meet you wherever it is that you need him to meet you. Last thing, Jesus is omnipresent, which is awesome, 
because it means he has the ability to be right here, right now, and he is. And he can be ahead of us. He can. He just simply says, trust that my grace is sufficient for you and my love is made perfect. My love is made perfect, even though your circumstances are far from perfect. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you promised to go ahead of us. And Lord, uh, we adopt this simple yet profound and effective prayer. Lord, we need you. And we need you to go ahead of us. Lord, we just simply ask for what we refer to as a a go-ahead. Lord, go ahead, please. So Lord, as we come to a time of reflection and remembering through communion, we're going to ask for a go-ahead. And we're going to fill in that blank specifically. And maybe there's multiple things that need to go in that blank. That's okay. You say, cast your burdens on me because I care for you. So here it is, Lord. Thank you for your love for us and that we can approach your throne of grace with confidence because of what you have done for us, not because of what we have or haven't done. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.